The views expressed on this program are those of the producers and individuals appearing on this program and do not necessarily reflect the views of the Sun Prairie Media Center staff, its video service providers, or the staff and elected officials of the City of Sun Prairie. Hello and welcome to Real Reviews. My name is Jameson Rabbit, and the man joining me this week, well, as he does every week, I suppose, can totally draw you a duck if you ask him. His name is Mike Roth. Um, I've watched an interesting uh, thing about ducks by Z. Frank. Uh huh. Not child appropriate, but hilarious. Um, corkscrews. That's the only thing I'm going to show it, uh, throw it. That's not like that uh, video we had to watch in middle school health ed class oh, with the duck, nothing. right? That no, you it's, it's this guy. He sounds a lot like. Uh, uh, hmm. The, I don't know. Blanked. I'm sorry, I had a stroke. Oh, shit. <laughs> series of mini strokes over here. I'm going to just stop now yeah. and recover before I have to review a movie. Oh, boy. Just power <laughs> down some of that energy drink and let's get going. Morgan sorry. Freeman. Morgan there. Freeman. Okay. Just nothing like being 30 seconds late. Nailed it. <laughs> Nailed it. Never a doubt. Uh, we have a few movies to discuss this week as well as getting into our center stage spotlight as we have uh, the last few weeks. I'm going to get us started with a film uh, that I got a chance to watch this week. It is an Icelandic film called A White White Day. This is another one of those films that was supposed to show at, uh, at the Wisconsin Film Festival this year. Mm -hmm. And I have made it uh, a mission of mine. Anytime there's an Icelandic movie, I watch it because they're always interesting. Hmm. Right? They're always... They're always original for the most part. So yeah. uh, this is no different. Uh, this kind of falls into a genre, which I didn't know was a genre until recently, but I love. It's called Nordic Noir. Okay. Yeah, a lot of like icy landscapes. There's been a murder. Uh -huh. Things are happening. There's an investigation out in the sparseness of Iceland. So anyways, White White Days, written, written and directed by Hilmir Palmason uh, and uh, stars Ingvar Sigurdsson as a man named, oh boy, <laughs> I, was, I know what's coming up. I was doing so well for a minute there. Uh, he, he stars as a man named Ing Ingmandar. Uh, my Icelandic is a little rusty. Um, the movie opens. We're on a super foggy road following this car mm -hmm. down this foggy mountain pass. And we see this car go off the mountain, through the fog, down the cliffside. We soon find out that the driver of this car was Ingmandar's wife. She died in this crash. I'm just looking at the names. Probably. Yeah, yeah, right. Oh. <laughs> um, and uh, he's this kind of this gruff older man who uh, you know lost his wife. He's the type of guy who buries his emotions. He's not going to show anyone, uh, you know, that he's he's mourning his loss. So he throws himself into his work, which is uh, he is a police officer. He throws himself into he's building a house. Um, so he kind of just buries everything and throws himself into that. Uh, the one thing is he has a granddaughter who he really loves. And she's kind of the only one who gets to see any kind of emotion other than anger from him. Okay. She kind of gets, you know, she can get to the heart of grandpa, you know. Um, and uh, at some point in this movie, he starts to suspect that his wife had been cheating on him. And in this tiny little town, that he might have been the only person who didn't know this. And... Oh. As a rough, gruff cop who uh, doesn't like being made a fool, he his anger starts to bubble up, and uh, uh, vengeance begins to become his uh, modus operandi, and he is not thrilled with I this situation. I suppose in a small town, vengeance is like nothing you could really do in secret. No, it doesn't come in secret <laughs> at all. Everyone knows. Um, and he begins to uh, work this investigation of who was the man and what am I going to do to this guy when I get him. And he goes through friends and foes alike on his way to find this guy. Um, and it's, it's an interesting movie. Um, it's a little slower paced than I think would be ideal for me. Like there's, um, like at one point we watch a rock falling down the hillside mm -hmm. and we watch this rock tumble and tumble and tumble in like 10 different shots of it coming down the hillside before it finally lands in the river. It's a several minute tumble of this <laughs> rock. We okay. also yeah. have a, uh, we have a five, like uh, legit five minutes we spend watching this insane Icelandic children's 
show where what the granddaughter is watching, and then it just goes to us watching the screen for like five minutes. And it's this insane children's show uh, that revolves around astronauts dying horrific death uh, with like, but it's like Teletubbies and ast in, as astronaut type things, and it's horrific death Maybe only in Iceland. Iceland's way of saying we can't afford a space parachute. I, I don't program. know. It was it was <laughs> crazy. A yeah, pretty wealthy nation. They should start one. Right. Yeah. Um, but kind of like as he's kind of drawn into his obsession for revenge, mm -hmm. the movie kind of slows way down, and um, it you feel it. But it's it's a kind of a pretty terrifying movie in parts. Like he's he's a pretty terrifying fellow, really. Yeah. It's more than anything. Um, of course, just beautiful shots. Anytime you get to show that landscape, it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, great performance from Ingvar Sigurdsson. Like he's legit, really good in this role, um, and. It's, I, I like that they don't necessarily make him a guy to root for. Like, you think at the beginning of the movie, here's this widower. Mm -hmm. He's lost his wife. He's caring for his granddaughter. He's just trying to build a house, blah, blah, blah. And you think, like, oh, this is a sympathetic character. And after a while, you're like, I don't know, he's not sympathetic at all. Like, huh. <laughs> he's, he's kind of a monster. Well, in five years, uh, there will be an American release. Oh, there this. always is. <laughs> there always is. <laughs> there I feel is. like every time I've seen one of these films, five years later... I, you get a watered down version it's of this, usually starring really Jai Courtney poor. or some yeah. horrible actor. But um, I think the best part of it, though, is there's this really beautiful ending. Mm -hmm. Like the last two, three minutes of it is is really worth getting through some of the other parts, watching okay. this insane kids show, because <laughs> the last like three minutes is really beautiful. So um, I enjoyed it. It's not one of the the best of these uh, genre of films, but uh, it's enjoyable for the performance. So I give uh, a white white day. Three and a half out of five stars. Worth tracking down, I suppose. Nice. So, uh, what do you have for us, sir? I have, um, I don't even know what to say. If it's a big thing streaming anymore. It's yeah, like, I don't know. Uh, either way, it's uh, Vampires vs. the Bronx. Love uh, this title. It, it, it's a great title. Um, it's a film about kids, which I usually love in like these little horror movies, when kids find out there's monsters in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And uh, these kids are fighting against the gentrification of the Bronx and also, simultaneously, vampires. <laughs> <laughs> um, start noticing uh, things in the Bronx are starting to get sold off. And all the owners of the sold off properties also end up missing at the same time. And then the next day, it seems like this building that was uh, a, a barber shop or a nail salon or a grocery store ends up becoming a bagel shop or a place where you could buy cheeses or sure. fancy coffees. <laughs> and it's all owned, um, these new uh, businesses and residential areas are all owned by a place called Marenu Enterprises, which is kind of a, a nod to um, the guy who directed Nosferatu right. way back when. Also, their emblem is of Vlad the Impaler. There is no secret that <laughs> these people are going to be the vampires coming up. <laughs> um, the children find out uh, three boys, uh, Miguel Martinez, played by Jane Michael, uh, Bobby Carter, played by Gerald Jones, and Louis Acosta, played by Gregory Diaz. Mm -hmm. um, they all find out about it, but they're young and about to butt into teenhood and of course when a kid tells you about a vampire obviously <laughs> it is not real it's right. actually not real when anybody but it's less real when it's a child so these kids go around trying to do their best on getting the proof that there is vampires in the bronx and a problem with gentrification all at the same time yeah and uh there we go uh, yeah i mean it's, <laughs> it's interesting because it does kind of hit on like you know, this happened in Brooklyn, yeah, where it was gentrified, and a lot of the tight knit neighborhood that was there that had been there for generations was kind of pushed out. Yeah, and it's like we're not letting that happen to the Bronx. You know, yeah. save the bodega is a big thing here because that's kind of like a meeting spot for for a lot of people. And and uh, there's a lot of characters in this movie that are these like neighborhood folks, you know, and mm -hmm. and of course, you know, the when the white folks start moving in, mm -hmm. it's trouble because they're vampires. Yeah. And, um, even the nicest ones. Yeah, even even <laughs> Vivian, you know, who seems so nice. Um, and Miguel, or I, I love his name, Lil Mayor. Mm -hmm. Lil Mayor is the first one to kind of realize this. But like you said, no one's, no, one's, no one's buying what he's selling. Which is 
the exact same with every kid's horror movie. Right. No one believes it. I mean, kid. you get a little, it, it becomes a bit, like, I think that the, the, the vampire plot line in this is super basic. Yeah. Incredibly basic. Mm. Um, it becomes a bit of a Lost Boys situation where, hey, nobody believes us. We've got to take on, we got to start getting holy water and crosses and things, and we got to go after the vampires mm-hmm. ourselves. Like, okay, I've seen this movie it, a long time ago. It had worse music. The big difference is uh, back then, it felt fresh. They had a nice little spin. There was really nothing creative at all about any of the story except for trying to push the message through. Right. And I, but that got watered down. Right. I did I did enjoy a lot of the characters. Like, I love Father Jackson, the priest in the neighborhood, played mm-hmm. by Method Man. Like, yeah. I love that and how suspicious he is of these kids. He's like, oh, no, I don't trust any of you guys. <laughs> like, I, I liked him. I liked the kids all identified with Blade. Yeah. Because, hey... He's the vampire hunter. Yeah, like, of course. And we, we're all about Blade. Um, yeah, I think that I think that a lot of the plot is very basic and generic. Outside of that, I think my favorite part of this movie has to be the kids' relationship with Frank, which is the uh, bodega. Um, yeah. The, grocery store and this was a safe place that the kids went to and they pretty much grew up there after school you can tell there's a bond Mm -hmm. he cares about them they care about him and i thought that part of the story was really cool Mm -hmm. but overall i thought this was just they had an idea they were like we want to expose this message but they did it in such a generic way where i i just kind of watched it yeah i can see that i i liked it kind of up to the point where the vampires reveal themselves Uh uh-huh and I was like, okay. Like, I was because I was enjoying like kind of just meeting the people in the neighborhood and the yeah. the girl who was constantly on Instagram Live or whatever doing her thing and kind of their relationship and you say relationship with Frank and all these things. It's when they started really trying to flesh out the vampires and like how Shea Wiggum, who is like the front man for the vampires, mm-hmm. who you know like his relationship with them, where I was like, nah, I'm kind of checked out on that. But yeah, uh, yeah I mean. Great. Uh, I mean, if you, I think if you're looking for a really good uh, movie of this type, Vampire in Brooklyn's where yeah. you want to go. I, I think it's a very fan, family <laughs> friendly movie, and especially during the Halloween time, really, that's it for new um, that I know of. Oh, well, there's we'll the talk new about some one other ones that are coming out soon. Next, but I'm not excited for that oh, one because you will we be, all Mike. know. You will be. <laughs> uh, what do you give Vampires versus the Bronx? I gave it a 2.5. I didn't think it was bad. I didn't think it was good. It's a watch. That's it's a it. watch. I like it. Um, yeah, I gave it three stars. I I enjoy these kids too. Like I I am a sucker for like good kid adventures. Yeah, it's pretty basic. Like this isn't a hard recommend for me, but uh, you know, it's enjoyable I, enough. And I watched The Babysitter recently, which yeah. isn't family friendly, no. but it's a pretty good, good kid. Stuff. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, let's get into another fun family film that we got this week. <laughs> uh, this one is called The True History of the Kelly Gang. Uh, this is a film, despite its title, really isn't a true history of anything. And they mention it right away. Right away too, they say, by the way, this is not yeah. uh, this is not factual. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is kind of telling the, the tall tales of Ned Kelly and his gang. And if you don't know who Ned Kelly was, he and his gang were kind of like Australia's answer to Billy the Kid or Jesse James and the James Gang. Mm-hmm. Like they were notorious outlaws of the 1800s who uh, uh, rebelled against authority, specifically the British rule over Australia at the time. Uh, and it stars a whole host of really interesting actors. Um, most notably, uh, George uh, McKay, uh, who we saw in 1917. Yeah. He stars as the elder Ned Kelly. We kind of are introduced to Ned as a kid. Orlando Schwartz plays the young Ned. I thought he was really interesting as a young Ned mm-hmm. and who is really just treated horribly from, from early on. Yeah. And he's taught horrible things by horrible people and all his life is surrounded with horrible people. Um, he's taught how to, uh, how to kill people and how to, how to fight back against the rule uh, by a man named Harry Power, played by Russell Crowe. Who gained weight a he, lot. He fluctuates. Yeah, he does. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I can identify with that. Uh, we also have uh, Charlie Hunnam, who plays Sergeant O'Neill, who's kind of a, an authority figure who um, is not a great guy. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, Essie Davis, who plays his mom through this movie. And his mom is an interesting character. In this. And not a great person. Either. No. And, <laughs> and as he grows up, I mean, he's... Ned Kelly becomes like a Robin Hood or any of these, like I said, Billy Kidd, an outlaw who kind of has the support of 
the community because he's fighting against the authorities who rule over them. And so, of course, they protect him. But he's he's kind of brutal. And um, we see how Ned kind of becomes who he became and what he was put through as a child. And, and he's he's his. He reminded me a lot of Cody Jarrett, uh, um, James Cagney's character in White Heat, whose okay. mom basically pulls the trigger for him at all times and like sets him off on directions like you you have to do this so you can't let him talk to you like that and that's kind of how i felt their relationship was here mm -hmm. like his mom mm -hmm. definitely knew how to pull the trigger on him and light him up I, I, all these characters were pretty bad characters but i didn't think anyone and it might be because everyone was um not uh, a high standing moral person <laughs> yeah, yeah. um it kind of made their immorality seem more digestible sure yep. um everybody seemed not as a villain just people during these times doing what they were taught to do and yeah. what they were raised to I mean, believe yeah because you look at i mean mm. these people i mean mid 1800s this is a colony of convicts right yeah who are under british rule like hey we have to be here because you're all convicts we're sending you to this prison island and, and it's like the mom um there's a, a a scene later on in the film where she's like you could tell that you are a really good mom by at what length your kids will do to save you yeah and she was totally cool with them all dying for her sure. because that proves that she's a good mom but the way um uh ellie uh elsie davis mm -hmm. um she portrayed that character it really didn't make it seem like she's evil you're like oh that's just what she believes right and yeah it's it's unfortunate but i feel like the only <laughs> redeemable character in here we also have uh nicholas holt who plays the constable uh in this film he's a horrible person oh, as yeah. well right all the constables were. i feel like the only person who and part of it is just because i love this actress okay and so i always root for her but thomason mckenzie is in here as ned's love yeah of sort uh mary and mm -hmm. she's, I mean, she's just sweet. I like her. She felt like the only one who was halfway innocent still in all yeah. of this. And it, she was used as a pawn. She was. Uh, I would, I say her loyalty to Ned was probably her evil side. Sure. And sure. that was it. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, I, I, like, I think this cast is great. You read down these mm -hmm. names and I'm like, I'm really impressed by this. Um, I like this story. Like, I was first exposed to who Ned Kelly was in the early 2000s, Heath Ledger. Uh, did a movie about Ned Kelly that I had stumbled on to okay. uh, another Australian film, much as this was, because he's an Australian legend. And, yep. you know, and uh, I was very intrigued by that. So when I saw this, I said, oh, check it out. It's kind of a very different telling of it. Um, and then I find out, like, oh, yeah, there's like 30 movies about Ned Kelly. <laughs> like, he's a legend. You well, know? I bet. I mean, they, they got Young Guns versions of this all over the place. Mm -hmm. But um, I really enjoyed this movie until, I don't know, it felt like there was about 40 minutes left in the movie where it felt like to me that they kind of bounced around a lot. It felt like the story itself was kind of moving around. It almost felt like I was missing pieces to what was going on and suddenly we're thrust into something else. And I think that was very purposeful. This movie felt very uh, herky-jerky. There was, um, it's very stylized, especially when you start getting down to the ending. But even with a costume design, it felt very much like something you would see out of a men's magazine in the current days. Mm -hmm. And it was hard to try to envision yourself into, because this was supposed to be 1880s or yeah. 1870s, and it really didn't feel like it. it had popular music and people are... There were some of the clothes, I'm like, that's not period, right? No, <laughs> it, a lot of it was, a designer was like, no, I mean, I get it. People wore shorts and pants. I'm going to just make it what I like. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and with a rare occasion where they go to something formal and uh, uh, the dresses and stuff yeah. could be envisioned as uh, period pieces. But for the most part, Ned wore a really nice shirt. Yeah, very stylish. Very clean. <laughs> very clean for her. Yeah, that's a good point. It's always interesting when you get into the, some of these period pieces like wow how is he staying clean yeah it's, is he wearing some color I, I don't know i don't know is that a, that's new <laughs> i mean my my take on this movie is like true or not you know i'm not going to delve into how much of this is factual about this no i think that for what they were doing and for for what the director was doing it it felt honest in its portrayal of what they were setting out to do yeah and i like that and i really like george mckay now, this is two movies that I recognize him in. I'm sure if I go into, he's been, you know, background of other films, but really it's just this in 1917 or the two where I'm like, okay, I know that guy. Well, and he was in Captain Fantastic, too, wasn't he? Was he? Oh, was he with the, the oldest son in that? Yeah. 
See, but that was before I knew who he was. Yeah. He was just that guy with the long face. Yeah. By the long face, buddy. <laughs> um, I think he was really good in this. I think the rest of the cast was really good. Nicholas Holt, I thought he was really good as a constable. Like, I wanted to see him get his comeuppance, you know? Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know. I, I think it was enjoyable. Full of really solid performances, uh, you know. I give it a thoughts? plus just with the beginning. Um, yeah. Because a lot of these, based on real movies, especially most of the ones that go to the major movie theaters, they make you think this could really happen and people really get confused on what the real story is. A lot of times, especially when it comes down to a horror, it's basically, the, well, yeah, there's a house, house out there that people yeah. think is haunted. Right. But everything else, yeah, we had to make up. This one starts off right away saying none of this is real and it's stylized to the point where you're like, oh, yeah, of course, this is not real. I do appreciate that because that was one of my complaints, one of my many complaints last year with Winchester, uh -huh. uh, which I was very excited for. Because that's an amazing story about that house. Yeah. And then they just basically told a whole different story that focused on nothing about the house or any facts or anything. And I was like, wow, you had an amazing story to work with. And you decided to focus on this fictional character yeah, who came you, in there. And you call it a true story because yeah. there is a house called the house. Winchester House. Yeah. There was a widow. Yep. <laughs> uh, what do you give the true history of the Kelly Gang? I give it a three point. Five. I, I did enjoy this film a lot. Um, I'm just a little confused on like the time period. I don't know if I really like the stylization mm -hmm. or if I wanted more um, actual, but I think it I think it works. I don't know. I enjoyed it. Yeah. Well, that's all that really matters, right? And that's yeah. why I gave it a three and a half as well. Um, I think performances are really good. I think uh, I think it's a good telling of the story. Like I said, I kind of got discombobulated for a minute there, uh, but. Uh, it's an enjoyable film, and it's just fun to watch uh, an interesting cast work together. Yeah. And, uh, I was down for that. So, uh, Sir, let's move ahead onto our center stage spotlight on Steve Martin. This week, what do we have to talk about? We're talking about Parenthood, not the TV show, oh, but the God. movie from 1989. This is directed by Ron Howard, and you can tell because a relative his, of his is in it. <laughs> <Always>. <laughs> Um, it's a story about the Buckman family and friends attempting to bring up their children. It goes from uh, uh, family to family on pretty much how things are different. This is not really the Steve Martin type uh, silly film where you want to sit your kids in front of and stuff. This is a serious look at a lot of different dimensions of how real people interact with each other. And there's times where it's funny, a lot of times it's serious, a lot of times it feels real. It is, hold, it holds up, I think, uh, over the years. And there's something like this. Hey, could, there's our guy oh, Keanu, yeah. and, right? And it's just filled with stars. We got Keanu Reeves, which we just finished our series on at least a, a little while ago. Steve Martin, Mary Steenberg. Um, Diane Joaquin Weiss was, Phoenix is in it. Diane which, Weiss was nominated for an Oscar for this role. I, I, think, I could see it. I could see it. Rick Moranis. Oh, Rick Moranis. Rick Moranis. Save Mick Rick Moranis. That guy got punched in the head this week. That's oh, not cool. that no. That's he is cool. a national treasure. He's a national treasure. He should be protected more than a lot of people who are protected. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> I agree. Uh, the great Jason Robards in this movie. Tom Hulse, who only did a couple of movies, won the Oscar for Amadeus, and then kind of did this and kind of disappeared on us. Yeah. Um, yeah. Martha Plimpton, Keanu. Yeah. Young Joaquin Phoenix. Amazing cast for the time. But at the time when you're watching this, did you already know it was uh, Joaquin Phoenix? No. Sure. Back then, his name was Leaf. He was Leaf. He was the kid from Explorers. Yeah. And I'm looking at him like he's so familiar and everybody else I'm watching. Or not Explorers, with, uh, Space Camp. That's where I knew him from. Yeah, yeah the kid from Space Camp. Yeah, every, everybody else was like, oh, we know that kid. Yeah. I'm like, no. <laughs> Whip out my phone. I'm like, yep. I, <laughs> he's the new Joker. This is one of my favorite Steve Martin films. And I've watched okay. it several times. It holds up really well. Yeah. And to your point, I think it's because this is a family drama with comedy inserted in there for levity. Yeah. But at its heart, it's about what makes families, I mean, there's, there's the, fa the, comp the competitiveness amongst family members. Mm -hmm. There's the judgmentalness that you'll have amongst family members. And this one's the black sheep. And, oh, that guy thinks he's better than me. And all these little things that you say in your families, secrets that you keep about each other, uh -huh. and just kind of just the drama. And everyone wants to look perfect, but nobody is in their real life. Yeah. And I like that. And that even... Problems big or problems small all matter because they're a part of your family. And so, you know, Tom Hulse's character might have a huge problem where yeah. he's got mobsters coming after him and he needs tons of money mm -hmm. from his dad. 
Or you might have small problems like Rick Moranis has with his family, but they all matter the same to you because it's your problems when you, within your family. And I just, I really enjoy this movie, and Steve Martin is like the heart of this movie, and I, I like that. Interestingly, I read about it, and Steve Martin's character is supposed to be like in his early 40s, I think, in this movie. Uh-huh. And I'm like, there's Steve Martin in his early 40s. Or maybe <laughs> late 30s, I think it was. Like, yeah. he's supposed to play 36 in this movie. Like, that guy don't look 36. No. How old was his kids? In this. I don't know. Martha Plimpton? She was yeah. like 18? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. That's uh, possible. Kids are kids. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I, I really enjoy Parenthood. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's a movie that my wife and I enjoy every time we put it on. I was kind of surprised one. that we did not do this with the last Keanu with series. Keanu? Yeah. You can only do Keanu for so long. The guy's made 190 movies. True. And this was like the last one where I felt like he was really doing the Keanu role yeah, he that he, he was, was kind of typecast it. in for a while. Yeah, he was. Up until recently where he redid that role. Yeah. <laughs> for Bill and Ted. We saw that. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, Parenthood is good stuff. Um, Let's take a look, sir, what is going to be coming soon. The weekend of October 16th, we have on Netflix, we have Aaron Sorkin's new film, which is direct to Netflix, a film called The Trial of the Chicago 7. It really has me interested. There's, I watched a great documentary about the Chicago 7. Okay. So I'm really curious to see how Aaron Sorkin takes this on. Okay. Uh, but that's on Netflix. We also have a film called, let's see, what do, you, what do we have next on there? Uh, Nocturne. Oh, here That's we go. That's cheating. I know. <laughs> Sometimes my order doesn't match up, but I give Mara in the booth. Uh, Nocturne, which is a new Blumhouse horror movie, and I'll get into that more in just a moment. Uh, it's a horror mystery from Blumhouse. That's on Amazon Prime. Uh, we also have a film called, I believe, The La Evil Eye. That's right, Evil Eye. Uh, which is another Blumhouse horror film that They're will also be out. They're just spilling out like crazy. I'll tell you about it in just a sec. Uh, and then fourth, uh, lastly, The Painted Bird, uh, which will be on Prime. It is a, a Czech World War II drama, uh, all about uh, drama in Czechoslovakia. Don't we have another Blumhouse next week? Too? So let me tell you about it. So... Uh, Blumhouse has a thing that they're doing on Amazon Prime called Welcome to Blumhouse all month where mm -hmm. they're releasing multiple horror, some of these are in quotes, horror movies because I've watched a couple of these and one of them is not a horror movie. But <laughs> um, yeah, we have several of them. Uh, next week we'll be talking about Black Box which is also on that list. Yeah, um, yeah, that's, they're going to be releasing them, uh, multiple ones per week I guess. Oh, which worries me when you churn out the same studio, churns out a ton of movies at the same time. like. I don't think the quality can hold on all those. No. So. It's probably a bunch of things they had on the shelf. And I think they, so. They're the one I watched the other night, money. it felt like it had been on the shelf. Oh, that's uh, not a anyways, feeling. Um, uh, before we go, though, I want to thank our sponsor, Marcus Theaters, the Palace here in Sun Prairie. Thank you for sponsoring this program. Thank you for keeping the lights on. Um, I'm going to the theater this week. There's a movie there that I'm going to check out. What are you going to check out? Oh, I'm going to check out uh, the new Robert De Niro movie, The War with Grandpa. Oh, uh, boy. You, sure you, come along? you lucky dog. Uh, <laughs> but they're showing it at the <laughs> palace, so I'll be there with my mask on and J13 reserved. Uh, but thank you for uh, always sponsoring this program. Uh, I, I want to tell you, there's a film that I reviewed earlier this year that uh -huh. still might be one of my favorite films of the year called Deer Skin about the guy yeah, I remember the Deerskin you. Jacket. It is now on HBO Max, so if you have HBO Max, check out Deer Skin. I love it. I have a fire stick. Uh, uh, HBO Max does not love that. No. Uh, next week, sir, we're going to be talking about, well, I'll have the war with Grandpa. Uh, we also have the aforementioned Black Box Blumhouse film. We have uh, Adam Sandler's Hubie Halloween. Uh, we also have a horror film called Books of Blood, and of course, our next chapter in our Center Stage series. Another great Steve Martin movie. Can't wait for all that. Uh, and we also can't wait for you to join us. Uh, we are on social media. We want you to join us there. So if you are on Facebook or Instagram, find us there. Uh, Real Reviews TV at Real Reviews TV. Find us there. Like us. Join us and uh, have some conversations with us. We uh, we're always posting stuff on there. Yeah. 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 So, anyways, until next week when we're going to talk about Adam Sandler and uh, maybe <laughs> he's got some vampire fangs in. I don't know. Oh, I don't want to talk about Adam Sandler. <laughs> you loved all the Hotel Transylvania movies, and you're going to love this. No, I didn't. But until that time, <laughs> I'm Jameson. I'm Mike Roth. Thanks for watching. He loved all the apps.